Hello, friends, internet, beautiful people. Welcome to another episode of the Roto World Football Podcast. My name is Josh Norris, and he was questionable earlier in the week. Mm-hmm. He is probable today. That's I'm John here. Daigle. That's not probable. That's active. Not probable like you're a full participant today. Well, we haven't started. We'll see if you make it through the whole episode. That's true. Daigle, what happened? Uh, if you watch the Sunday show closely, you'll see me wiggling my shoulders and popping my neck a little bit. Oh. And it turns out for the past month, I've had a shoulder contusion and it was so bad. It got so bad overnight Sunday yeah. that I had to go to the ER around midnight, uh, got back around five in the morning, texted you waiver pickups and said, hey, I'll come into the studio. Just we let me know what them. time. No. And also you didn't to make me come in. I was no. going to come in on painkillers and just do the show. We got you covered. Because I love the people. That's what friends are for. And that's what having more people in Stanford's for. So <laughs> did you just find yourself laying in bed, staring at the ceiling, being like, oh, this is so much back pain, I cannot handle it? I, I actually passed out due to the intensity of the migraines. Passed out. Yeah, I passed out due to the intensity of the migraines because it crept up my neck and like my whole neck was bulging. Like, it, it was bad. It was a bad scene. How was the Stanford hospital experience? Uh, six hours there, but they told me I should be lucky <laughs> because if you go during the middle of the day, apparently it's much worse. So six hours was short. Yes. And then you leave with the good stuff. Did right. they ask you like your pain tolerance from one to 10? Yeah, I said six, but also I'm very stubborn. Hence why I didn't go the past month. To the hard head you have. Hence why I didn't go the past month. So, uh, I don't know what a lot of pain would be to me. Yeah. I'm you know, sure. you get a day off every week. One why, day. Didn't, why didn't you? Yeah, you it's know. not even a day off though. I still have to write. Colin, okay, so. well, let's not complain. But about we're here. That. We're good now. We are here. Uh, in today's episode, we're going to do our game preview extravaganza hit on nine games. Three with just me and John. Three with Roto Pat when he joins us. And three with Hayne Winks to close the show. I do want to remind you to subscribe to this episode, to this podcast if you enjoy it. Rate and review. It helps us so much if you review the podcast. Just go down to that little box, write a review, leave five stars. Boom. Thank you. All right, Daigle, let's kick it off with fun game. Minnesota Vikings at the Detroit Lions. It's a pick em game. Uh, with a total of 45, each team expected to score 22 and a half. What an interesting game the Lions are coming off of, Mm -hmm. losing to the Green Bay Packers in chaotic fashion. Meanwhile, the Minnesota Vikings were able to get their passing game going last week was against the Philadelphia Eagles. The Lions should technically be undefeated when you think about it. They They came a Patrick Mahomes MVP last second drive away from winning that game against the Chiefs. And then this past week, you can pin it on the reps. Uh, However, the past two weeks, they've also, or the past two games, I should say, since they hit their bye, they have shown a weakness, and it's a bad weakness to show against the Vikings who love to run the ball. Hmm. And that is without Mike Daniels and Deshaun Hand, uh, over five and a half yards per attempt allowed to LaShawn McCoy. And then as we saw against Green Bay, over 100 yards for Jamal Williams and another 47 yards on 11 carries to Aaron Jones. This is not the time to be missing those guys. No. So it's important to watch if those guys play against this Vikings team who, along with the 49ers in neutral situations, just love to pound the ball. Yeah, and the Vikings are 4-2. and two. As we mentioned, the Lions are 2-2-1. Two, two, and one. But they're coming off two disastrous losses. I yeah. mean, the one against the Packers on, was it Monday night? No, Sunday night football. No, mm-hmm. Monday night football. Monday, Monday night, night football, football. Packers. Um, was, you know, they had that game won. They had the game won against the Kansas City Chiefs the week before and fumbled on the one-inch yard line, right? There were, there's still hope, though. That there game is. against the Packers, that was offensive play calling to the T. It I was mean, perfect. And for how, I mean, average their record is with 2-2-1, two, two, and one, and I, I mean, I wasn't excited at all for this Lions team heading into the season. Mm-hmm. They're an exciting football team. Mm-hmm. I mean, how Matthew Stafford started that game off, I believe, as a flea flicker and then throwing downfield yeah. to Kenny Galladay. They've got some defensive playmakers. Tons as well. of Just, first down shots deep. Yep. Justin Coleman is really fun in the slot as well. I, I'm excited about this Lions team, again, despite how average this record is. They do have some history with this Vikings and a Mike Zimmer-led defense. Uh, Detroit failed to score a touchdown on 22 drives against the Vikings last season. you think they break that this year? Yeah, they're going to score a touchdown in this game. Probably, yeah. So so the Vikings offense, they have leaned on Kirk Cousins the past two games against the Giants and the Eagles. Right. That is a completely different secondary as opposed to the Lions, who are very good. Um, Very good against the past in particular. So I just think this is a game they go right back to Dalvin Cook, and we see what happens. Um, With the Vikings, big picture look here, is this team good enough to really make noise in the NFC? Like heading into the season, I think people expected them to. And in many ways, the identity of what they wanted this team to be is who they are. Running the football extremely well with Dalvin Cook and Alexander Madison when he comes to the team. I don't think the defense is as good as, or as consistent as they hope for. Like they're not one of those top five units right. in the NFL right now. But, I mean, you talk about the 49ers. You talk about the Seahawks, the Saints when they get Drew Brees back, the Rams, the Packers, maybe even the Panthers. 
Did the Vikings even belong in that group with them? I mean, they're a good team, but are they among that top echelon group? Their pass defense is still good. It's just the fact that Xavier Rhodes isn't playing as well as he has in the past. Uh, PFF just charged him with 28 of 33 targets his way to get caught, which has not been historically his forte. Usually he's a shutdown corner. Yeah. And now he gets Kenny Galladay, who the Lions are making concerted effort to get involved downfield. Like He has 150 more air yards than Marvin Jones. He is their go-to receiver, who I think you should still be buying high on in fantasy. Me too. I don't think he's hit his ceiling just yet. And you know how much I, I wasn't crushing Kenny Galladay hitting the season. He's just not on any of my rosters. Yeah, I wasn't drafting. I preferred all the Rams receivers to him and put Kenny Galladay a tier lower because I didn't think they would use him properly. But the fact is they are, and hence why Stafford's like air yards per attempt is so high this year. To close on this, I actually think that Kirk Cousins has been like too much of a punching back lately he's fine he's good in a structure he was just so poor in good situations to start the year um I I think that's fair ish but when you look at across the league where quarterbacks are struggling and completely tanking their teams he might not make that play outside of structure where you say okay yes this guy's worth 84 million dollars guaranteed but if there's a good plan in place with good blocking and really good receivers and a good running game, I mean, this is a playoff caliber team. Well, if you don't think... I mean, that, that's a lot of what if. If you don't think Cousins is so worth $84 far, million, then what are you saying when Jared Goff makes a play for $120 million guaranteed? Well, you don't want me talking about Jared Goff. We will later in the show, though, I believe. Uh, okay, next game, the Philadelphia Eagles at the Dallas Cowboys. Dallas is, and this is Sunday Night Football, Dallas is favored by three points. Both teams are three and three. The Dallas Cowboys have actually lost three yep. straight games. Uh, both teams dealing with a whole bunch of injuries. I mean, Amari Cooper likely out for Dallas. Their tackles are questionable heading into this with Tyron mm-hmm. Smith and Lyle Collins. On Philadelphia side, Jason Peters is week to week. Deshaun Jackson is still sidelined. They are getting back Jalen Mills and Ronald Darby. But it really comes down to if Kellen Moore and Dak Prescott can get this passing game going against this weekend Philadelphia Eagles secondary so far this season, but maybe it gets better this week. Not only the passing game, but do they get play action involved? The first three games, which were wins, Dak Dak used play action on 39% of attempts. 11 yards per attempt from play action, by the way. The past three games, maybe not so coincidentally losses, uh, 17% play action. Just a plummet. And why? Uh, Zeke has been used more in the passing game in those last three games. 35 routes per game, plus an extra five targets per game, as opposed to the first three weeks when he was barely used on two targets per game. So they have sacrificed play action, which makes them a much more efficient offense to get their $100 million back involved, and it's a detriment. If they are using him just because of the money, then it's a bad sign that they re-signed him. Like they shouldn't have done that because they have done it to make their team worse. Uh, I'll be honest. Did you list the percentages of play action passing over the last two 39 weeks? 39 and 7. Oh, the past two weeks. I yeah. said the so last 30, three weeks is 17. Yeah, it, you're, you're right. I was going to mention it, but you did. No, um, it's okay. <laughs> with Philadelphia, I mean, Carson Wentz is playing unbelievable football. Like, yes. Dak is up and down. Three three good games. Three average games, I would say. Mm-hmm. Carson Wentz is, is un- 12 touchdowns, three interceptions. And a lot of us, including myself, suggested he might be in that MVP race. I think if the Eagles weren't 3-3 three and three, and they were on more nationally televised games so far, games that came down to the wire, he would be mentioned around there. But with how they haven't really been getting this running game going, I mean, Miles Sanders has more receiving yards this year than yeah. rushing yards. You've seen what happened the past two games with their offense, right? Dallas, yeah. Dallas Goddard's played over 70% of the yeah. snaps the past two games because they've used him now off of the injury report. Because remember, he was hobbled going to that Thursday night game, and so they used him what they could. But he's been healthy the past two games, and thus they've used more 12 personnel, and it's opened up the offense more. Dallas Goddard has kind of become a sneaky streamer and that – the position, tight end position, after tight end eight, is so weak and volatile that if you just start Dallas Goddard and hope for a touchdown every week, it also gives you outs if Zach Ertz is injured because then you have a tight end one. I was mentioning this with Ian earlier in the week because, I mean, it all lines up to Michael Gallup having an explosive game, yeah. a major game. Ian's not so certain. Where do you stand on this? Yeah, I would say, I'm again, we're not worried about Philly's secondary whatsoever. Kurt, e- even with Jalen Mills and Ronald Darby coming back? I don't care. I don't care either. Those, those are third-string corners like on other teams. That's not yeah. a big deal. Um, but the fact is, without Amari Cooper, they probably do take a step back. However, we shouldn't chase in fantasy, because I know a lot of people have mentioned this. You don't want to go to Tavon or Cobb or Devin Smith. It's clearly uh, Michael Gallup gets raised if Amari Cooper's out, right. and then everyone else just kind of mixes in. You don't want to grab from that pool of players. Probably a wide receiver, too. 
Yeah, I, I mean, he's been weekend. a wide receiver too, anyways, right? Like, I agree. Uh, with Cooper, so I and would say. And even coming back from his multi week injury, he looked great. I would say top 20 for sure. Yeah. Nice. Um, and I know a lot of focus has been on the Cowboys' offense and how it struggled the second three weeks versus the first three weeks. Yeah. It's their defense that's struggled all year long. Demarcus Lawrence hasn't looked himself no. whatsoever. And even the linebackers who played fast and. Uh, were aggressive last year and made big plays. They're not really doing it. The secondary is kind of average. Byron Jones came best. into the season with a hip injury, and I still wonder if he's uh, if it lingers because he's been in and out of the lineup as well. Um, yeah, it's been bad news for their defense, who's not creating turnovers, not sacking the quarterback, right. and not making plays at all. Yeah, I mean, in this 3-3 three and three bowl, I, I could see if Philly shuts down the Dallas running game and those um, players coming back from injury in the secondary do really help. I could definitely see Philly winning this game despite being three-point underdogs. I am 100% concerned. And if Tyron Smith and Lyle Collins are out, out, it is a disaster from this Eagles squad who still ranks top four in pressure rate created. Yep, for sure. Uh, do you ever listen back to our podcast after we're done? Um, sometimes. I've been told not to because people have told me just let my natural energy flow Okay. as opposed to trying to correct myself. Yeah, I mean, I'm no expert in this field at all. What am I doing? Are you about to tell no, me No, 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 oh, no, no. Okay. This is actually, like, please point it out. No, this is actually a self-reflective moment because I go back and listen or watch everything that I do because that's just how I get better. Sure. And I could not have read yesterday's ad any worse. Like, word for word, I screwed it up completely. I mean, it, it was unbelievably bad. So I need to not get fired and fix that today. Go for if it. If you don't mind. I'll sit so right here. In order to save, and I need to save my job, save your fantasy season, go and check out the Rotorold DFS Toolkit or the Rotorold Season Pass. And both of those are 30% off right now. For the Season Pass, go to rotorold.com slash win. For the DFS, rotorold.com slash DFS. And use promo code NFL30. Again, promo code NFL30. For 30% off the season pass. Season pass is $20 right now, right? It's even less than that. Even less than that? See, I think the price point is a better selling point than the 30% off. Just tell the people, hey, 10, 15 bucks, what is that? Four coffees, two coffees if you live in LA, and just pay it. It's fun. Hashtag don't get fired. California is actually the state where we get the most listens from. Really? Each month. What By think, far. Why do you think that like is? Like double. It's so large, you know. Okay. We I mean, got, Texas is large. I mean, we, we fit in with the Hayden Winks. The market out there. You know, Hayden's just oh, forcing it, everyone yeah. to listen to it. Our Chargers personnel guy, yeah. Okay, let's close out this trio of games with just me and you with the New England Patriots at the New York Jets. This is Monday Night Football. Um, Patriots, even on the road, nine and a half point favorites. A little shocking when you consider that the Jets are coming off a massive win against the aforementioned Dallas Cowboys. Mm-hmm. And Sam Darnold, that 92-yard touchdown is what we loved from him last year. That was playmaking in the pocket, stepped up, the blitz was blocked, and just fired it man-on-man downfield. Um, The Jets have instilled life now. They have given hope to fantasy players because Sam Darnold did what we we were concerned he couldn't do upon his immediate return. Um, However, we know the Patriots. Like, they now get the best defense in the league by far. So what does Sam Darnold do? And I do think it's a step back. I'm quite concerned. Uh, Robbie Anderson won't get free from Stephen, uh, Stephon Gilmore Correct. as he did against the Cowboys defense. Uh, our proximity to the New York area means there are a lot of Jets fans in the newsroom. Mm-hmm. And the optimism for a team winning one game is wild. Wild, yeah. It's ludicrous. It's reflected in the line. That should be a 10-plus point line. Correct. And it's just 9.5. I mean, the Jets are only expected to score 16.5, but they are a 1-14. in 14. This is a one-game sample, really, we're looking at for the Jets because even in that week one, we know Sam Darnold was dealing with mono. Um, if I can you know, give some optimism a little bit more to the Jets. It's that I'm not even sure if this Patriots offense has really hit its stride. Like, I know they put up 35, 33, 30, and 43 points so far this season, but how much of that is from the defense? I mean, it's defensive touchdowns. It's defense making short fields for them. And, you know, there's been some injuries. It's been a bit chaotic offensively because of the Antonio Brown situation, and then he's off the team. Philip Dorsett getting injured, Josh Gordon getting injured, Julian Edelman getting injured, Rex Burkhead. Like, injuries across the board, and I would even say their offensive line's not playing up to the caliber that it has the past couple of years. And even in so many defeats, four defeats to start the season for the Jets, their defense was still being competitive. See, we knock on their offense, but I think they've done a good job handling whatever cards they've been dealt. Because remember, James Devlin, two games, loses, uh, out for the year now, injured reserve, and then they have to make shift 11 personnel. That's fine. They call up Jacob Johnson, their backup fullback from the practice squad. Go back to 21 personnel, he's now out for the year. Correct. Um, So they have to make shift 11 personnel again, and this is with... 
Julian Edelman and Josh Gordon in and out of the lineup. That's why Jacoby Myers then struck on four catches for 54 yards last week. So I would think they now come back out Monday night and more 11 personnel, whether Gordon's healthy or not, and you will utilize Jacoby Myers, yeah. and you will just uh, you should flourish that way. And Philip Dorsett, if he plays, I think you can go right back to him, honestly. And Julian Edelman's been a top 10 wide receiver over the past yep. two weeks. Um, on the Jets side, and again, I'm not like alluding that the Patriots are going to lose this game, but there is a little bit of optimism there as we have witnessed. This is the litmus test. Yeah, they, I, I would agree. They now have an actual opponent to play against. Off that up, upset win against the Cowboys, we know that Sam Darnold looked fantastic. The issue is the Jets still can't run block. No. At all. And that's a major issue when you're paying so much money to a running back when he's still the focus. I doubt that they slow it down as much as they did when Luke Falk was in there because that was, you know, Adam Gase going back to his Dolphins, not roots, but his time there and saying, our roster sucks so bad right now offensively yeah. that we're just trying to limit the amount of opportunities the other team gets. But I am concerned when, I mean, they're not going to run as much on first down, but I am concerned that balance and is needed somewhat when a secondary is so good maybe the Patriots have the best secondary in the league that the Jets if they can do anything it might be up front and the, their offensive line still can't run block having said that uh Le'Veon Bell's 15, 14 15 carries last week are a buy low opportunity for fantasy owners uh that's going to increase and his one catch in particular are going to increase so I think you jump on it right now at his lowest point Time now to bring on Roto Pat for the next trio of games. Pat, Los Angeles Rams go to the Atlanta Falcons with the Rams three-point favorites on the road. A ridiculous total, if my math is correct, of 54 yep. in this game. Pat, it's been a pretty wild week for the Rams. Not often do you trade two future first-round picks for a player who it's kind of still up in the air if he even plays in this game. But if so, we will see Jalen Ramsey probably shadow Julio Jones. First off, how dare you begin the podcast without trying to pronounce my name? Uh, second off, uh, this is going to be it's a weird, weird game because, like you said, we don't know who's going to be out there at corner for the Rams. Uh, the, the 54 over under, the highest of the week by far. You know, so many negative narratives surrounding both teams, but the Matt Ryan's going for a seventh straight 300 yard game to begin the season. Uh, we know Cooper Cut or uh, Jared Goff coming off maybe the worst start of his career. We know all about Road Goff, but the Falcons' defense has been almost Dolphins esque. Uh, they're allowing an 8.6 yards per attempt, over a 70% completion percentage, a 15 to 2 touchdown interception ratio, uh, generating absolutely no pressure. And we know it's the pressure that's been Goff's Achilles heel this season and his entire career. So, uh, I. I this is all this is like all systems go a green light game for both teams even in missing a game Brandon Cook still leads this entire squad in air yards so is there a is there one in particular you're looking at that could be better than the other because as we know the Falcons corners have been bullied all year long they have I mean, I'm still I'm giving Cooper Cup a huge rankings advantage because yeah. before this thing went off the rails last week I think he had two or three straight nine reception, 100-yard games. I mean, his targets have been in the mid-teens. Uh, there's just zero doubt as to who Jared Goff's uh, preferred target is. And, you know, this could definitely be a Brandon Cook's ceiling game, but Brandon Cook's ceiling games are becoming fewer and farther between. Uh, I can't remember what the stat was. Ian Harditz had a great stat uh, that something about he's been held under some number of targets three times this season, and it was only, only twice, I think maybe five targets, he said, three sub five target games this season and he had only two all of last year so it's like the Rams offense is kind of retreating Jared Goff is leaning more you know on his security blanket which was already Cooper Cup and that's just been taken to the extreme this year and I think all three are top 20 plays kind of like back in the day like the 2013-14 the Broncos all three of the guys will still be viable but I think Cooper Cup has a, a pretty big leg up on both Robert Woods and Brandon Cooks. Yeah, this is a three-game losing streak, as we know, for the Rams. It's a get-right spot this week against the Falcons. It's a get-right spot next week against the Cincinnati Bengals. And then it's a bye week. It, Pat, it kind of makes me believe that, you know, how we think about the Rams sitting right now at 3-3 three and three on a three-game losing streak, that the perception of them in three weeks is going to be completely different. And I don't think that's necessarily fair. You know, I think we kind of need to remember how we feel in this moment and not just remember the good times in a couple weeks when they should ha have wins and victories over these Falcons and Bengals teams because both of those teams are among the worst defensively in the league. 
They, I mean, at the, in a worst case scenario, they'll be four and four going into right. the bye. Obviously, they're going to beat the Bengals. I wouldn't take this game, you know, at one hundred percent for granted. It's a classic backs against the wall game for the Falcons. I mean, they're actually talking about firing Dan Quinn. Perhaps this will be Dan Quinn's Mike McCarthy moment where. There is no bottom. There is no backs against the wall triumph. Like it's just over, over. Uh, but I agree. I mean, the Rams should be five and three going to the bye, and I agree that these two games won't really tell us anything about them, though. Right. And uh, yeah, Daigle, I know that you want to talk about Daryl Henderson. It's, this is a game where <laughs> Todd Gurley is a question. Mm-hmm. Michael Brown is questionable as well. Um, do you expect either one of them to play? Because if either do play, they will certainly see more touches than Henderson. So we're recording this on a Thursday. Obviously, on Wednesday, Todd Gurley was limited. Malcolm Brown was out with an ankle injury uh, day-to-day. But if Todd Gurley plays, that's the guy who last we saw him got 93% of their snaps. Correct. If Todd Gurley plays, I rank him as a top-10 play this week. If Todd Gurley is out, I play Daryl Henderson over Malcolm Brown because the ceiling is that much higher. And I understand Brown got their two goal line carries and was stuffed on them. But uh, you watched Daryl Henderson. Oh, I did. did those, you, those two runs outside did. of the first drive oh were the only electric plays that the Rams made the entire game. I, exactly. I got to interrupt you, too, because I wish you guys could have seen John's joy. I was at NBC <laughs> last weekend watching the game with John. You should have seen his joy. Even when through Henderson pain, looked. even through a back and shoulder pain, <laughs> yes. how he was smiling like a little child I, on I Christmas. I actually like, stood up and watched the game the moment I saw Daryl Henderson take off. It was he how about fumble? How'd you react really to that seen, fumble? Yeah, the fumble was a, well, that's why he hasn't been playing, huh? Yep. Like that was a rookie mistake, <laughs> yep. but we saw his ceiling, and it's so much better than Malcolm Brown's. That's why Daryl Henderson's still such a stash, and I truly would play him over Malcolm Brown if Gurley's out. I truly would. Pat, where do you have Gurley ranked right now? I have him RB fifteen. This, you know, as we kind of talked about in the past, uh, Gurley playing ninety three percent of those snaps. There was probably a correlation between him doing that and then missing a game. Mm-hmm. So I'm not expecting that to happen again. Right. I, th- I think it'll be more like that 60 to 70 range again. I kind of think Malcolm Brown will be out. And I think Daryl Henderson, as you said, he was the only Rams player who looked explosive. I mean, he was the only one who kind of did anything positive with the ball in his hands. I think he will. That was like a show me game for Daryl Henderson. Like he had only played two snaps all year and he showed the Rams coaching staff that at the very least he's ready to make some plays. Uh, the fumble was bad. But if Malcolm Brown's out, Todd Gurley starts, I think it's going to be 60, 70 for Gurley and then 20, 30 for Daryl Henderson, making, putting him on the flex radar in a game with a 54 over under. Yeah, and I know the Rams are on the road, but you go from maybe the best defense in the NFL, the 49ers, to other than the Miami Dolphins, the, the worst, worst defense yeah. in the NFL in the Falcons. But it's also wild to watch Grady Jarrett play football because he's still playing at an extremely high level, getting disruption. There's just no one else in the backfield even close to making a play on the ball. Matt so Ryan's Grady, arguably an MVP, and it I doesn't agree. matter. At all. And it doesn't matter. It's it. This is a fascinating case study of how just an awful, awful defense can completely tank your mm-hmm. season completely. Uh, okay, Pat. Let's move on over to your favorite football player in the world of all time. <laughs> that is My Kyle Daryl Murray uh, and the Arizona Cardinals taking on the New York Giants. Uh, the Giants, Pat, surprised three point favorites at home with a total of forty nine in this game. I mean, they did they did they did expose Tom Brady last week, so I guess maybe Vegas is uh, kind of still basking in the afterglow of that. But I am surprised. Uh, I mean, I guess I guess we can't be surprised. The Cardinals' defense is that bad still, but I mean, the Giants' defense is that bad still. There, they're in the in the conversation with uh, the Dolphins and Falcons for having one of the worst defenses in the league. They're allowing almost 300 passing yards per week, uh, over nine yards per attempt, and. You know, Kyler Murray, uh, we folks thought on the early struggles, but he hasn't finished below QB 18 all season. He's the QB 7 by average points now. Uh, he's the QB 8 and QB 5 over the past two weeks. Uh, both those were in great matchups, but this is another great matchup. And Kyler, to me, is a very clear top 8 uh, play at quarterback this week. I mean, he was fantastic. I, I wrote about it in Ranking the Rookies, Pat, that Kyler Murray is just elevating the entire team around him. You look that early in the first quarter, he threw that bomb to Trent Sherfield along the left corner, who was left sideline, who was completely covered. Uh, Larry Fitzgerald in the middle of the field when he had immediate pressure from Tack McKinley off the left tackle, ducked it, stayed in the pocket, threw it down for the middle of the field. And then Demir Bird, this bomb that was like 60 yards in the air, like he's making and sacking those plays each week. Um, but Daigle, on the other side of this, 
you have a Giants team with Saquon Barkley, mm -hmm. most likely returning, Evan Ingram, most likely returning, Sterling Shepard, most likely returning, which completely changes the way that this offense looks with Daniel Jones at quarterback. Yes, but you left out the part where Patrick Peterson is also returning mm -hmm. on the other side of the ball. I did. He's which, out which, for six weeks. Yeah, which shuts down. Uh, well, it just depends, right? Because if Sterling Shepard plays, who was limited, then Golden Tate, the last time they played together, played 90% of the snaps in the slot, and that puts Sterling Shepard on the outside. If not – then do they move Peterson to the slot against Tate? Because they don't no run idea. him against they don't run him against Slayton, right? Do we even yes, know? This is all guesswork. We don't know. Yeah. Last year, remember, they didn't shadow use Peterson as a shadow at all, but that was also a terrible coaching staff. Right. Completely different this year. Um, but Daniel Jones, the Cardinals and until this point, have allowed or they're 28th in yards per play allowed. So in what should be a get right matchup, because Daniel Jones has looked terrible the past two weeks, uh, Pat, where do you have him ranked? I was the QB of like 14 or 15 because the matchup is so good. Patrick Peterson, we really don't know what to expect. I mean, he's never played for this coaching staff before, and he is coming off a steroid suspension. Uh, he, he's probably still going to be the same Patrick Peterson, but it is worth mentioning that. Uh, Daniel, I'm just hedging a little bit because like he, he was – so as much as this is a good matchup uh, for Daniel Jones, you could also say Daniel Jones is a good matchup for a struggling Cardinals defense. Hmm. I still expect Danny to take more advantage than the Cardinals, but – I'm just you got to hedge a little bit with the cuz we don't know if Sterling Shepard's going to play. I really don't know how much Golden Tate has left. I mean, last week was all about one play against the Patriots is how Golden Tate got his numbers. Uh, Evan Ingram of course is going awesome. to erupt yeah. against a Cardinals defense. They've allowed uh, over 100 more yards to tight ends than any other defense. So, I'm hedging Danny a little, but I mean, he, I've got him right on the QB1 periphery. Yeah, I mean, neither of these teams are going to factor in the playoffs when it's all said and done, right? They're just not complete teams enough to How do that. How dare you? <laughs> Tyler Murray but, is going to make it happen. But really, what we watch football for is entertainment. And Kyler Murray right now is one of the more entertaining players yes. across the league. And Cliff is doing a little bit better. I mean, I was giving him grief to start the season because all he was doing was throwing to his slot wide receivers – but last week, he got both running backs involved in the passing game. Mm -hmm. He got David Johnson involved there. And Chase Edmonds, again, once you squeeze it out of the bottle, you can't put it back it was in. He better than David Johnson. A little bit, yeah. And David Johnson was also dealing with the back pain. Maybe, I mean, he played. I called him. Said, yeah. What do I, I said, do? Again, he played. To... Someone didn't show up on Monday. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Ed. <laughs> Uh, I, okay, tried let's to. Just, <laughs> I tried to. Uh, let me talk about Pat for a second. Pat writes the rankings on the website. Go and check this out if you need any start sick questions. And obviously get at him on Twitter at Roto Pat. Uh, Pat, let's close out your segment here with the Baltimore Ravens at the Seattle Seahawks as they get the death stare from John Daigle. <laughs> uh, Seattle are four point favorites at home in this game. Pat, historically, two amazing defenses in the Ravens for about 20 years, in the Seahawks for about the past decade. You have to say the opposite now for both of these teams. Yeah, except for the, you know, the Ravens just fixed their defense, of course, by trading for Marcus Peters. Uh, Made it worse. So it's all it's all fixed now. Yeah, I, I would say they probably did make it worse. Uh, yeah, crazy game. I mean, you would not. This would not normally be a green light game for fantasy, would it? But uh, it is. Uh, Russell Wilson is leading the league in touchdown percentage at seven point four. He is leading the league in interception percentage at zero point zero. Uh, he's completing a career high, 72.5% of his passes. This is all basically a white way of saying we didn't think there was any way Russell Wilson could match last year's efficiency, and now somehow he's bettering it. Uh, he's a freak. He's the MVP front runner right now. And whereas Lamar Jackson, you know, uh, kind of going in the opposite direction as a passer, he has only four passing touchdowns over his past four games, uh, but he's done that while averaging 13 rushes for 85 yards and almost seven yards per carry as a rusher, which we have not seen from a quarterback since Michael Vick. I mean, not even Cam Newton has ever had a running stretch like this or even like what Lamar had at the end of last season. So, yeah, this is not – this is a game to attack when, uh, you know, this is like a tiebreaker game. If you have someone in this game, mm. if you're deciding between DK Metcalf and another wide receiver three, uh, you know, this is the kind of game where you, you attack this game. And what do you say about Mark Ingram? Because he's now gone three straight games under 75 yards in a game that should have been – that worked out well for him last week. It did not work out well because he's finished with 53. Uh, so, yeah, Mark Ingram has just struggled the past three games. Do you tell everyone to go right back to him in this matchup? I am. He's been frustratingly, I mean, very disappointingly touchdown dependent, but he's second in the league in rushing touchdowns. So kind of what are you supposed to do? And there will be drives to finish in this game. And for as much as Lamar Jackson is running, you know, even the Ravens, you kind of, 
you like to hold off of red zone goal line running back quarterback carries if you can to avoid that punishment and so it's a high scoring game he's been finishing drives and there's going to be drives to finish in this game but yeah mark ingram being like the life hack rb1 was going to be all about in like a uh, passing game involvement and it just hasn't materialized and so yeah he's a He's on. He's in that RB one two borderline every week, but yeah, he is frustratingly touchdown dependent. He should have been much more. Marquise Brown was out of practice on Wednesday. We'll see if that changes. It's a big change with him not in the lineup. I mean, they really truly don't have a vertical threat, and he's he's declined at least production wise as the season has gone along. I mean, he started the season on fire, and now he's down. I think back to back games of of twenty two yards. Uh, Jaron Reed returns on Seattle's defensive line. That could be huge to stop the run game. They go. Let me throw this out there and get your thoughts on this. Um, other than the Kansas City Chiefs, I believe the Seattle Seahawks are the best offense in the NFL. Right now, they know who they are, and they do it extremely well. With Russell Wilson at quarterback, Chris Carson is owning that backfield. Mm-hmm. Tyler Lockett is fantastic in his role. And every single week, DK Metcalf is able to harness his athletic ability just a little bit more, and Seattle adds another wrinkle to his game each and every week. And again, other than the Chiefs, best offense in the NFL. And they've actually been better than the Chiefs, right? We're just taking Patrick Mahomes exactly. over everyone else. And, and Tyreek Hill coming back in the fold, all that. What's funny is that the one game, if you include five points to 300-yard bonuses, the one game Russ finished under 28 fantasy points was against the Cardinals. Because hmm. remember, they didn't need him that game. No. They just ran over the Cardinals. So, yeah, you're probably right. Those Pat? are the top two. You, you're ignoring the season-killing loss of Will Disley. You joke, um, but it's kind of a big 15% deal. 15% of the target's mm-hmm. vacated now. It is a big. It is actually a big deal. Um, but yeah, it's a not a season killing loss. Big deal. I don't know who I would say uh, the second best off. I have no one comes to mind off the top of my head. Like the Seahawks, it's like kind of thing. If you're not thinking about it, you hear someone say the Seahawks the second best offense in the NFL, and you kind of just shake your head yes because uh, nothing better comes to mind. That was Patrick Doherty again. Go and check out his rankings over at Rotorog. I say Doherty now. It's Darty. Patrick Darty. Darty. Hayden Winks is one of my favorites because Hayden Winks is name you cannot. I'm gonna say because you can't screw up his name. Yeah. Uh, he writes the fantasy forecast column, which is fantastic. Go mm-hmm. and check that out up on the site. We bring on Hayden for these final three games. Hayden, let's start off with the Houston Texans at the Indianapolis Colts. Colts are one and a half point favorites at home. Hayden, I feel like some people are forgetting Colts off a bye after beating the Kansas City Chiefs, but can they slow down the Houston Texans offense just like they did the Chiefs before the bye? Well, they did last year to, to an extent. Deshaun Watson back-to-back games last season against the Colts with under 20 fantasy points. Um, but I think that's just like just kind of variance taking over things. I, I think the Colts uh, zone defense plays it uh, plays into that a little bit. But Deshaun Watson's fourth in passing touchdowns, sixth in rushing touchdowns is obviously a, a top five fantasy quarterback. I think the the real discussion is with DeAndre Hopkins and Will Fuller. What's going to happen with those two? I think this is a game that more built for DeAndre Hopkins and Will Fuller. Um, the Colts are allowing fewer plays over the top and more plays over the middle. So that uh, should get DeAndre Hopkins back on the wide receiver one train. I want to spend this to the Colts offense really quick because the last time we saw Marlon Mack, he handled a career high 29 carries. Uh, this Texans defense though is sixth highest rush defense DVOA, yet they've allowed the most receptions to running backs in the league. Hmm. So do you see Marlon Mack coming through with a big game here or uh, should we be concerned? Yeah, I think it's kind of kind of in between. I don't really expect Marlon Mack to start catching a lot of passes just because they're playing the Texans. I think that's uh, more about who the Colts have played. I haven't looked exactly at their schedule, but Marlon Mack hasn't really been a pass catcher too much. Um, so, yeah, I, I, he's averaging 20 carries per game, so I think he's the volume's there. They're a favorite, so that helps him. He's not going to fall. He shouldn't fall out of the game script. Um, and he's kind of due for some positive touchdown regression. He has 470 rushing yards and only two two touchdowns, so um, I think he's right on the RB1-2 uh, borderline. Man, the desert just likes the Colts a lot more than I do. You know, like their favorites in this game, they're expected to score almost 25 points. They're three and two. But like, Hayden, when you look at it offensively, nothing really scares you because, I mean, I think Jacoby Brissett kind of limits the big playability that T.Y. Hilton or Mm -hmm. anyone else has. They have a great offensive line and they can run the ball. But even defensively, Hayden, no one scares you on that side of the ball either. They don't have a primary pass rusher interior or the outside. Malik Hooker is out, so you're worried about the secondary in some ways. 
and you look at the schedule. Like, sure, they beat the Chiefs prior to this, but that was with Sammy, without Sammy Watkins, right, and Tyree Kill, basically. Then they lost to the Raiders before that. They barely beat the Falcons, only put 27 points on them. They barely beat the Titans, and they lost the Chargers to start the season. I, the Colts don't scare me in any way, and I could be totally wrong when they finish the season 10-6, and 6, and they sit 3-2 and 2 right now. just doesn't make sense. Yeah, I think it's just they're well coached, which helps. Um, but yeah, as you as you alluded to, Jacoby Brissett's just so limiting on this offense. T.Y. Hilton's averaging 3.4 yards shallower per target in 2019 compared to last season. Um, that was courtesy of Ian Hartitz. And yeah, it's just, I don't know. The, the upside is, like, I'm not sure why they're projected to score, what, 25 points this week. Um, doesn't make a whole lot of sense to right. me. I think this is going to be more of a, like, 21-point game uh for each team so yeah I, I, it's ty it's like on the wide receiver two three train marlon mack and then everyone else is pretty much irrelevant let's go to the next game so three and two oakland raiders traveling to the green bay packers who are six and one uh and are favorite in this game and i don't know if this is by just but i'm gonna say just six and a half mm-hmm. just six and a half the raiders are also coming off a bye after beating the bears over in london they actually beat the colts prior to that two game winning streak here for the Raiders, Hayden, um, I, Josh Jacobs has been playing out of his mind. Can he keep playing out of his mind against his Packers front? Well, it just it kind of depends if the Raiders are finally going to start using him in the passing game or not. Obviously, a six-point dog, that doesn't really set up for Jacobs. I posted a, a usage based off of point differential earlier, and Jacobs is basically seeing 25% of the team usage when the Raiders are trailing, which is uh, you usually want to see those like at 40%. And he only has six receptions. So if the Raiders fall behind, hopefully we get to see Jacobs more in the passing game. But that is definitely a concern. Um, another note, Tyrell Williams is, has a plantar fascia problem. Um, he's questionable, even if he's active. Right. Um, he's kind I'm of not, irrelevant now, right? Because of just yeah. how Derek Carr plays the game. He's not someone yep. who holds onto the football and allows these downfield routes to, to explode. He's throw to Darren Waller or throw to not Josh Jacobs because for some reason they don't want to use him in the passing game. And Zay Jones is averaging under four yards a catch. Like, it's not really a situation you want to target. Yeah, yeah. Hayden, what about um, this Packers offense? Because I know, like, numbers-wise, I, I don't know if it points to this, but I think they're hitting their stride, even without Devontae Adams. Mm. And even last week, like, they had some turnovers, especially with Aaron Jones and his dropped touchdown. But we know he had four touchdowns the previous week. And then... Just looking at it visually, I think Aaron Rodgers is kind of in command. They found a nice little groove of where this offense is going right now. Yeah, they're putting up points up right now. The, the problem right now is the injury report. Devontae Adams, Marquez Valdez, Scanley, Geronimo Allison, and Jimmy Graham all didn't practice yesterday mm. on their like estimated practice report. So we got to keep an eye on those. Uh, obviously, Jake Kumro and Alan Lazard would come into play if if multiple of those guys are out. Um and yeah, it's just the the big question that for this game is Aaron Jones versus Jamal Williams split. Williams out snapped Jones and out touched him last week. Obviously, Jones had those two terrible plays. Um, I think both of them could be worth flexes at least as six point favorites over the Raiders. Um, but that's this game is going to be pretty telling on what their usage is going to be for the rest of the year. Again, I, it was a controversial law a win, I should say, against the Detroit Lions, but. The Packers' only loss is 34 to 27 to the Eagles. Uh, okay, let's close it out here with the Los Angeles Chargers going to the Tennessee Titans. Titans are two point favorites with a teeny tiny total of just 40 points in this game. Both teams are two and four, but Hayden, the biggest change is Blaine, not Blaine Gabbert, but basically Blaine Gabbert <laughs> starting for the Tennessee Titans. Yeah. And maybe just a little bit more than that in Ryan Tannehill with Marcus Mariota really being benched for the first time in his career. What's the trickle down there? I don't think much changes. Like they're they're kind of similar quarterbacks. Uh I, I would rather have Ryan Tanhill if I was in like an AJ Brown Brown or Corey Dave owner, but hopefully you aren't one of those because they haven't been producing at all. I think it's just Derrick Henry. Uh he has at, he has at least fifteen carries in all six games, two point favorites. The Chargers are twenty third in PFF's run defense grade. So the game sets up well for Derrick Henry, but he, He's still so touchdown dependent. Um, luckily, he gets basically every single touch inside the 10-yard line for the, for the Titans. So um, he's still on the RB1-2 borderline for me. But outside of that, you kind of just want to avoid the Titans. 
the more Melvin Gordon becomes available, the more the Chargers use him, which has tanked Austin Eckler pretty much. So how do you think this backfield shakes out as it pertains to this game against the Titans? Yeah, so last week when the Chargers were losing, Melvin Gordon still outsnapped Eckler 37-28. to 28, And that yeah, that's really good for Melvin Gordon owners and best ball drafters like myself. Uh, but yeah, not I don't think that that really helped the Chargers much at all. Um, another thing of note, Mike Williams had insane air yards usage his last couple weeks. Um, he's definitely a buy low candidate. I don't think the Chargers are going to be passed as often as they were recently. Um, but yeah, he just he has so much usage compared to his production right now. If AJ Brown was getting as much usage and volume as Terry McLaurin is, we'd be talking about AJ Brown. Because he's an unbelievable talent. He's insane. I mean, hopefully yeah. the Titans understand that, hey, we need to get this guy who's big and runs fast and wins after the catch of the football more often rather than just throwing it to him like four or five times a game. Targets, I should say. Targets <laughs> four or five times a game. Because every time you turn it on, he is an unbelievable football player. Both teams have lost four and five. Again, it'll be fascinating to see which team comes out. And really game. quickly, one more. Uh, Keenan Allen, 14 targets, average his first three games. Last three games, five and a half targets. Hayden, tell us where to go on this. I would just slide him kind of in between that. Obviously, we got to be a little worried about Henry's back, Melvin Gordon's back, Austin Eckler's still out of target in that part of the field. So there's competition there. But if the Chargers' offensive line can't get going, then the Chargers are just probably going to have to pass the ball. Their defense is not very good this year. And yeah, I think Keenan's going to bounce back. But uh, those days, like the yeah. wide receiver one overall are over. Yeah, look. Can't get any worse for the Titans. Seven points combined in the last two games. Um, it'll get even better for us on Sunday, by the way. Roto World Live, noon Eastern. These three. Twitch.tv slash Roto World. I'll be there. Hopefully, Daigle will make it I'll be by there. then. He's not too old by then. Uh, and Hayden Winks will be joining us. Hayden Winks for the first time in studio. No nerves, Hayden. You know, it's just three guys talking about football. That's all we're going to be doing. Again, that's on NBC Sports' YouTube page, twitch.tv slash Roto World, answering all your start questions. Start and sit questions for those 45 minutes. Uh, that's it. That's it, man. Go listen to the rest of the podcast prior to this one for the rest of the week. Mm -hmm. Listen to these all the way up until Sunday. Go check out the Fantasy Forecast column. Go check out Pat's rankings. Go and check out all the other good stuff we have on Roto World. Tell one friend. Tell one friend. See you all soon. Bye.